Kia ora, tēnā kōta katoa. Hello everybody, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to uh, this IFLA journal uh, webinar on how to get published. So in this webinar, we will be covering uh, how to get published generally. So publishing in academic journals uh, more widely, but we do have a specific focus on IFLA journal. So um, these are your presenters today. So as myself, I'm Professor of Library and Information Management at Victoria University of Wellington here in Aotearoa. Um, uh, my co colleagues today are uh, Amanda Cossum, uh, Dr. Amanda Cossum, who is a Principal Lecturer at the Open Polytechnic, uh, again here in Aotearoa. And we are joined by Jayshree Mantora, who is Scholarly Communications Librarian at James Cook University in Australia. So uh, Amanda and myself are on the editorial committee of uh, IFLA Journal, and we've got Jayshree coming, uh, coming along to give us her view as a published author, so as an author who was published in IFLA Journal. So hopefully today you will be getting both sides of the story, uh, from the editorial side and also from the author side. Just the thing about, uh, just, a, just a note about privacy here, you'll see that this event is being recorded uh, and uh, the recorded sessions uh, are going to be posted um, uh, on the website, uh, on the IFLA Journal uh, webinar website, um, and eventually we hope to find a more permanent home for them. I think uh, our editor Steve Witt is going to try to collect them all and publish them somewhere so there's a bit of a more permanent record so you can access them at any time. Um, this is one of a series of webinars, uh, and you know, it might be worth popping into the others once they're recorded as well. Uh, we, we have different views. Uh, a lot of us have different views on publishing and uh, being published, so it might be worth your while uh, catching up with some of the others. Um, we will leave some uh, time for questions or comments at the end, so as we're going along, uh, just uh, type into the chat box or leave your questions for the end and we will uh, catch up with you then. All right, so this is the agenda. Uh, I'm going to uh, focus on uh, why we publish in the first place and how you might go about choosing a journal in which to publish. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about IFLA Journal more generally, so why you might want to publish specifically in IFLA Journal. Uh, Amanda's then going to come in and talk about the editorial and peer review process. Uh, and as we said, we have uh, Jay Shree coming along to talk about her experiences of being published in, uh, in uh, IFLA Journal and um, yeah, the whole process, really, what she thought of the whole process. Uh, Amanda's then going to quickly uh, pop back to talk about the kinds of support and resources that you can expect from the journal and also from the publisher uh, of the journal, that's Sage Publications. Uh, so they have a range of support that you can draw on, uh, both before and after publication. And as I say, hopefully uh, you'll have some interesting questions for us at the end. So, first of all, why should we publish and how do we go about choosing a publish in which uh, to uh, disseminate our research and our ideas? So the first point there is we know that there's a lot of research going on, not just in academia, um, but also among our practitioner colleagues. Um, so, um, and it is being presented. Yeah, we know it's being presented. We go to conferences. Most of them have been virtual over the last uh, 18 months or so. Um, but we know that they're going on and lots of interesting work being discussed. Um, but sometimes we feel it deserves a wider audience. It's great to, to, to talk about your work in conferences or workshops or seminars, and perhaps to get useful feedback on that work as well. Um, but then, you know, it's great to give it a wider audience, to involve others in that conversation and that discussion, um, and to let people know that, yes, we're doing this here, 
Uh, and that leads on to the second point, really. Um, you know, a lot of academic publishing is uh, focused um, in North America uh, and perhaps, um, you know, in the, in the UK and, and Northern Europe, uh, Northern Hemisphere, really. So, uh, you know, this is a kind of a plea for the rest of us to get involved here. Uh, and we have something to say, you know, especially um, people from uh, different cultures and different communities. And I'm thinking of perhaps indigenous communities here um, that we have in this in, in our region. Um, they have different perspectives. Yeah, we've got different perspectives. We've got different ways of looking at information and knowledge and dissemination uh, and information literacy. You know, it, it, it's uh, it has a different perspective uh, very often, um, and, and it's worth shouting about. And it's worth letting everybody else know uh, that there are different perspectives on this. Uh, and you know, the northern hemisphere way is not always uh, the only way. Uh, the third point there, um, uh, yeah, it, it's about, it, it li links back to that first point, really, about sharing our knowledge, letting other people know what we're doing, perhaps showing evidence of good practice and effective practice in our areas. So other people can say, well, that's a, that's a good point. We could copy that here or we could adapt that for use here. Uh, and take on those ideas. So um, sharing our professional knowledge and letting others benefit from it. The fourth point, uh, we don't really have a tenure system um, or you know, few places have a tenure system for, for uh, academics and librarians uh, on the same model as say in the United States. Um, but that's not to say that your publishing efforts won't go unrecognized by your employers. Uh, it is evidence that you are, you know, you're interested, you're staying up to date with current trends, uh, you're interested in developments in our field, and it's about external engagement, isn't it? Um, so um, although it might not be a, a, a huge area that your employers will look at when they're thinking of, of promotion or perhaps, you know, recruitment in recruitment, it will show that you're interested, that you're involved uh, and that you like to stay up to date. The last point here is really uh, for academics um, rather than practitioners. Um, it's our job. As academics, it's our job to research and to publish. And uh, you know, our uh, academic career basically depends on it. Uh, so uh, it's very important for us uh, to do that. All right, let's think about choosing a journal then. Um, uh, the first five points are really about how we go about choosing our journal. Um, and the last four are about once we've chosen our journal, uh, how do we go about familiarizing ourselves with it really? Um, one point I think uh, that's important to make is that you probably shouldn't just focus on one journal. Uh, and a little bit later, Amanda will probably talk about, you know, if your paper isn't accepted, um, perhaps you can you know, recast it, reframe it, rewrite it, revise it and submit it uh, again to a different journal. So perhaps it's a good idea to have a short list of journals that you want to you want to target, maybe two or three, um, uh, and and work work your way down them if necessarily if necessary. Hopefully you won't need to do that. Uh, the first point then is who do you want to have a conversation with? Uh, it's the first two points really. Who is your audience? Who do you want to have a conversation with? Who you know. Where is the discussion that you want to join? Is it, is it national? Is it global? Is it the whole of the profession? Is it a specific subsector of the profession? Is it something that's perhaps allied to the profession? So think about, you know, who would be interested in your work uh, and who um, perhaps would you like to, you know, comment on your work as well? Um, because as we'll discuss later on, you know, the reviewers will comment. You'll have expert reviewers uh, commenting on your work. And obviously journals uh, uh, select their reviewers on their expertise. So the other points I've already mentioned, 
is it a national, you know, will, is it of interest just nationally, or do you think it's, you know, there's a potential global audience for it? The fourth point is very important, and Jay Shree will say more about this, I think. Um, but, you know, as uh, information professionals, we support open access and access, free access to information. So how important is it for you that the journal you're publishing in is open access? Uh, do you want to be seen to be, um, you know, doing what you preach, yeah? Practicing what you preach there. Um, uh, so as we will discuss, if the journal is open access, so uh, that's a good option if you're, um, if you're focused on open access. The other aspect is metrics then, you know, how important is it for you that the journal you are publishing in has an impact factor, for example, um, is in various, you know, quarters of the um, Symago or, you know, so is, and also indexing, you know, is it indexed in the various um, large databases? You, discoverability is an important point there as well. So you need to think about all those points when you're um, selecting the journal to publish in. The last four points there is once you've targeted a journal, honed in on a, the journal you want to publish in, um, have a flick through some recent issues uh, just to make sure it is the right journal for you and also to get a feel of the kind of the tone of the articles, the structure of the articles, um, you know, the length of the articles, the use of language, those kinds of issues. Always read the guidelines for authors, and that will tell you a good, uh, give you a good idea about the scope of the journal uh, and the kinds of papers that they select. Uh, have a look at the about page. Again, tells you about the aims of the journal, who they're reaching out to, who their audience is. Um, and you might want to email the editor. Um, now, you won't always get a reply, <laughs> or you might get a, a reply that says, please submit to the journal. Um, but sometimes it's a good idea to email the editor and just say, I've got this idea for a paper, I've done this work, this is what it's about, this is what I did, you know, would you be interested? Would the journal be interested? Is this in scope for the journal? Yeah. Um, and uh, often, you know, you will get a response saying yay or nay. Um, sometimes, as I say, they might just say, just submit and we'll sort it out of the submission process. So just a little bit about IFLA uh, journal aims and scope then. Um, we have the editor. Uh, our editor is Steve Witt and he's based at the University of Illinois at um, Urbana-Champaign. Uh, and uh, as it says, IFLA Journal is published by Sage Publications, which is um, a, a global company, uh, academic publisher. Um, the link I've given you there is to their journal's homepage, um, but they also have a, uh, they also publish books, uh, academic books. Um, so, you know, a, a good, uh, well-known academic publisher. Uh, just a few points there about, um, you know, the, the scope, the aims uh, that you can find on the website uh, under the about uh, link. So peer reviewed articles and different types of articles that um, IFLA journal publishes. Um, so original research, empirical articles, case studies, essays, literature reviews. We'll look at those uh, in a little while. So a wide range of different types of paper um, that uh, accommodate different styles and different types of research. Okay, so why publish then in IFLA Journal? Um, it has a global readership, yeah, so it, it, uh, and authorship. 
Yeah, so uh, papers and readers from uh, all around the world. It does have a reach in developing countries. As I say, it is open access. So uh, there is that benefit. Um, all papers are uh, published in English, but the abstracts are in seven languages. So again, you, you know, you, you get, um, you would get interest from uh, across the, across, across the globe. Uh, and these last points are really all about the open access uh, nature of the journal. Um, no embargo, no issues about archiving your um, uh, accepted manuscripts, so you can archive them in your, um, your own institutional repositories or, you know, any repository you want to. Um, the article is published online and usually published online before the print publication, so, um, you know, very quickly after your article, your final article is accepted uh, and it's gone through the proof stage, it will be published online. Uh, and that can be quite a quick process. So quite a quick turnaround there. And as I said, it's open access. So um, it, it's open access via the SAGE uh, website, the journal's website, but also you can access it through IFLA, the IFLA website as well. All right, so let's have a think about these types of submissions. So original articles, what we're really talking about there are accounts of empirical research. Yeah? So when you've gone out and collected original data, whether that's quantitative data or qualitative data through surveys, through interviews, through focus groups, or both, yeah? multi-methods or mixed methods, um, and you've written up uh, the findings of, of that research, that data gathering. So that's what we mean by original articles, really. Review articles then, um, usually uh, reviews of the literature, so comprehensive, sometimes systematic reviews, not always systematic reviews, um, but literature reviews, uh, reviews of the literature and other sources on a particular topic. Um, What's probably important about those is that they're not just so and so said this, so and so said that. So, -and -so. you know, it's there has to be some kind of synthesis and, in, uh, you know, engagement and, um, you know, uh, highlighting the key issues now, current developments, and perhaps looking to the future and maybe identifying gaps in the literature as well. Case studies. Um, so this can be of a, you know, um, a particular institution or uh, an area or perhaps a country. Um, I suppose one of the issues here, it, it, you know, case study shouldn't just be an account of how we did things here. Yeah, but again, there has to be some kind of implications for your global readership. So this is how, this is what happened here, and this is how it relates to the body of knowledge or what we know already about this topic. And here is how it takes our understanding forward. Yeah? Essays are more of a, um, I suppose, it, it, they can be a literature review. So on a particular topic, um, perhaps not as systematic or as comprehensive as review articles, more of a positioning uh, paper, really, or an opinion paper. Um, again, though, you know, they, they should be critical and perhaps offer, offer us lessons or implications rather than they're not just a soapbox and uh, an opportunity for you to rant about something. Uh, you know, they should be measured and perhaps point to, you know, where this area is going and, and what we think about it. Typical article length then, 3,000 to 8,000 words, so quite a generous word count. Um, a range of research approaches, as I've said, so it could be a, you know, the literature review, it could be a quantitative survey, it could be a content analysis, for example. So very wide range of research approaches are uh, appropriate for a, a IFLA journal. On a range of diverse topics, if you look at the uh, journal homepage, you'll, you can see uh, the kind of topics. Um, so obviously in the area of library and information uh, studies or science, but it's a broad church. There are also special issues, so keep an eye out for special issues. These are usually on, um, you know, the IFLA listservs, sometimes on social media, 
Um, so, you know, follow appropriate groups, follow IFLA uh, on social media, and you'll see calls for these special is issues. I think the most recent special issue, um, perhaps Jay Shri can talk about this one as well, was about um, uh, indigenous, yeah, uh, indigenous communities, uh, the information needs and information approaches of indigenous uh, communities. Uh, and how to submit. So um, uh, I, I think um, Amanda will go, go through this a little bit more, but um, if the journal uses Sage Track, what they call Sage Track, it's their branding for their system on Manuscript Central. So it's all a completely online system. You have to register with the system uh, and then you can submit your paper. All right, so now I will to, uh, hand over to uh, Amanda, who will take you through the next few slides. Thanks, Anne. So before I move on to that, I'd, I'd just like to emphasize publishing can be really daunting. And there's often a fear of imposter syndrome, but your work is valuable. And as Anne mentioned earlier in the presentation, you can stand up and and present your research at a conference, but it's only available to those at the conference. And even if there's a recording available afterwards, it's still less accessible than if you've got it on print somewhere where it can be more widely disseminated. So don't succumb to imposter syndrome and get your research out there. There are some key steps that you can take when you're thinking about even just writing up your research. Um, and it's before you even start writing the manuscript itself. Read the submission guidelines. Think about the type of paper that you actually want to provide and the referencing style that you might need to use. That helps frame some of the ways in which you're going to communicate with the journal's audience. Look at the word limits. Is 3,000 words what you're aiming for? Is 8,000? Do you actually really want to write 25,000? In which case, it's probably not a journal article. How are you going to frame the title so it's appealing and the abstract and what kinds of keywords are you going to pick out? What are the conventions of academic writing that you want to address? And then there are some basics around actually checking the, the paper itself, writing well, getting somebody else to read through it is pretty important when you get to the point of does this all make sense? Um, other things, can I have next slide? No, oh, so, sorry, say on the same slide, Anne. Um, other things to check before submitting is, have you really covered what you think you've covered in the paper? And that can be a hard one because you know the topic and you know what it's covered. So give it to a friend or colleague and say, what's the key takeaway from this? Do you know why I did the research? Um, do you understand how I did the research? What's the impact going to be? They need to be able to tell you those things. Um, I learned a really helpful tip from Sydney can't think of her surname, at Victoria University, who said, try putting your article text into a word cloud generator and see what the big words are that come out of it. If you think you're talking about information literacy and that doesn't appear at all in your word cloud, you clear, or not, not in big in the center, you clearly haven't explained your topic well enough. Have you covered only what's relevant and nothing else? Or have you been a little bit self-indulgent? We all really get attached to our research. So think about the aspects that will give value to the reader, not just the ones that you want to talk about yourself. And then there's a whole lot of practicalities. Did you, I think this might be the next slide, Anne. Um, did you um, anonymize the paper? Is that required? Have you got some good keywords and where will you find them? Um, and can you go on to the next slide? Um, did you spell check it? Is the journal laid out? Is it laid out the way the journal wants you to lay it out? Um, have you actually stuck to the word limit? Are you sure of that or have you fudged it a bit? Um, don't use APA if they want footnotes. Don't use Chicago if they want APA. Um, and use an appropriate form of English for the journal. And so if it's American English or UK English or Australian English or whatever, it may great when you have to do that, but you're just going to suck it up, change your language on your computer and 
put it through the process like that. Um, check all these kinds of key things around the copyright and ethics. You've got to get permission for your copyright material eventually, although you don't necessarily have to have that when you submit the paper straight up. Make sure you've covered all the authors, make sure you've acknowledged your funder or anybody else who's significant and anonymize that if there's a problem with it going into the review process. Do acknowledge conflicts of interest. Mostly there aren't any, but it's much better to acknowledge one than have a reviewer say, yes, but what about this? The IFLA journal, like so many others, works to the COPE, um, which is the Committee on Publication Ethics Statement. It's worth having a look at that to see what kind of ethical things you might need to address and be sure that you've covered um, in preparing your actual manuscript. Before you go into the journal system, make sure you've got your abstract written and your keywords selected because it can take quite a while to, to find the keywords. If you're not sure, check to see whether there's a list for the journal or look at other papers. And then once you've submitted, be prepared to wait because it's not a quick process. So you submitted it and what might happen initially, well, the editor will look at it and then there may be an editor's desk reject. And I'm gonna talk about desk rejects when I talk about rejections in a few slides. So let's say the editor goes, yep, this paper's pretty valid. We can send it off for review. And it goes then to the journal's review panel. In the case of the IFLA journal, the editor uses the editorial board, I think pretty much primarily, maybe pulls in other people from time to time as reviewers. So he's got the tame pool of reviewers and lucky, lucky him because the review process is frequently the slowest part of publication and I and Anne know this from our experience with other journals it's really hard to get reviewers um, people say they'll do it and then they forget they get busy you invite somebody in a country where there's a lot of COVID like India all my Indian reviewers currently are going I said I could do it but I can't do it and it is really time consuming to find the right reviewers to get people to accept to get the reviews back so as an author you do need to be patient then you can get to the point where once the reviewers have come back in, um, it may be rejected and the editor will make that call based on what the um, reviewers have actually said. Um, you might be asked to revise and resubmit or just to revise and the editor will look it up before it's accepted and for minor revisions, that's often what happens. What the reviewers are asked in each journal varies, but with this journal, what we're asked is, I'll, I'll just read that bit. Is the submission a significant contribution in terms of the knowledge or the information conveyed? So we consider advancement of knowledge, level of scholarship, um, is the submission original, and is there new informational data? Those are all the things we need to look at. And then, is the submission sound in terms of methodology, and findings and structure. So it's theoretical soundness, acceptable research design and appropriate methodology and analysis. We can say anything else we like as well, but those are the key questions that we ask. And each journal will have different things that they're looking at. And some will work through overall contribution, uh, literature review, methodology, findings, results and communication, those kinds of things. So the reviewers will work from that and read through the paper. Um, reviewers genuinely want papers to be good and they want authors work to be the best that it can be for the author. Having said that, the comments can seem harsh or even rude. I've certainly had tears on occasion. <laughs> Got the reviewers comments back. But because it's our research and we feel ownership for it, it's hard not to feel a little aggrieved when you feel that the other person hasn't got what you're trying to communicate. Um, you can certainly learn from their comments. Sometimes you learn that you don't want to have anything to do with them ever again. But it doesn't also mean that all reviewers will be equally as knowledgeable and kind and unbiased and disinterested and as generous as we would all like them to be all authors get unpleasant reviews, reviewer two syndrome, it's the second one who absolutely slashes the research to bits, that happens. But it isn't the end of the world. 
And there are poor reviewers as much as there are good reviewers. And like authors, reviewers are only human and they have good days and bad days. Editors work to avoid that, but this can happen. Take a step back from your paper when you've got the reviewer's comments back and then come back to it after two or three days. Can we have the next slide, Anne? It is incredibly rare that there'll be no changes asked for, even if you're a world-class author who's been writing for years and is extremely competent, there'll always be something that you've missed or haven't covered or that a reviewer thinks would add benefit to the paper or that you forgot to put in or the typo that you missed. There's always, always something. Um, but that's okay. You get the chance to make it as good as it possibly can be. More usually, you're asked to review because you haven't clarified why the research problem was important, why it was valid and necessary. Sure, there may be a research gap, but do we need to actually fill that gap? You might not have covered your research approach or the method particularly well. There might need to be more explanation. Why did you choose that? Why was it the most appropriate? How did you actually do it? A lot of literature reviews that we see lack really good synthesis. It's not an annotated bibliography. It's can you demonstrate that you understand a large body of literature related to your topic. You'll never be able to cover everything, but don't just list this was published in this year, this was published in that year. Often too, authors present their findings really well. They summarize that data, but they don't actually discuss those results particularly well. Or you get one short paragraph. So great, we wanna know the actual data that you got, but we also want to know what it means and what it means in the context of that lovely literature review that you did earlier in the paper. Um, you, you also need to think about things like, does the requested revision actually make good sense to you or does it undermine what you've done? All reviewers have their own perspective. Um, and so if it's really bad, you don't have to resubmit. You could try somewhere else. But if you disagree with a reviewer, it's fine to say that. This is peer review. It's not marking. And often bad reviewers think of it as marking and authors receive it as if their work was being marked. You can push back. You can say, no, this is not relevant because. But that's an important step for the editor because all the editor is seeing is, what the reviewer has said and you're coming back and going, I don't agree with that. They need to know why. So it is fine to disagree, but say why you're disagreeing or you know, even if it's covered in my other paper. So reference your paper in the current one. It can be um, difficult when you have contra contradictory reviewer responses and you can often get advice from, from the editor on that. Um, I think our editor would be quite supportive of that. He's, he's an excellent editor. And I have to say, as an editorial board member, he's great to work with. Um, follow your timeframes requested for the review. That's pretty important. If you can't meet them for some reason, liaise with the editor about it. And when it says demonstrate what has changed and address each referee point, don't say I've, I've, I've accepted all the points. We want to know, yes, I've accepted all of where there have been typos and incorrect things. I've added in four things that you recommended. I've rewritten this paragraph in these ways, and I disagree with these things for these reasons. It's hard to be positive, but this is just a process that your paper is going through. It's not a reflection on you as an individual. It's just what's, the, what's in the paper. It can take two to three iterations. Normally it doesn't, um, but it can do. And again, if the editor comes back to you with a second revision, it's, it's because your paper's worth persisting with. They, he really wants to publish your paper. And it's he in this case, because Steve's he. Um, so don't see it as a negative, but just see it as continual polishing. Having said that, one revision is usual and three very rarely in my experience. Can I have the next slide, Anne? Thank you. So you can be rejected and there are lots of reasons why you might be rejected. So we mentioned desk rejection earlier and a desk rejection is when the editor reads it and goes, I don't want to publish this. And there's some 
really sound reasons for that. Firstly, they may think that it needs more work in and of itself. So that's quite straightforward. Um, the, those sorts of things may be they want it restructured or they want you to rewrite bits of it or there needs to be more detail somewhere. Um, there may be some flaws in the way you've presented some of the information and you get the opportunity to do that revision before it goes to the reviewers because the reviewers will just tell you this. It could be that the paper is simply out of scope for the journal and that's a common one. It could be that it's poorly written and in that case the editor is likely to direct you to some of the editorial services that SAGE offers so you do get the chance to um, work with someone who's a bit more expert in rewriting the paper. Um, one rejection isn't the end of the world, it just totally feels like it. And many papers are rejected and I can't off the top of my head remember the stats for any of the journals I'm involved with, but a lot of papers are rejected from a journal, especially the more popular journals where they can afford to take the best papers. Um, I've, I've read, and I agree with this up to a point, that an editor is better to reject something that turns out to be good rather than publish something that's definitely going to be a dud. So they'll err on the side of caution. So you get back your rejection, read what's been said about the paper, and then go away for a few days, and then come back and read it again. See if you can work out why it wasn't rejected, why it was rejected, and what you could have done about that. Now, if it's a simple, I needed to submit this somewhere else, it was out of scope, that's really easy to, to handle. If there were some fundamental flaws in that, it goes back to are there flaws in what you did as the research, or are there flaws in the way you wrote that up? And hopefully it's just in the way you wrote that up. You can try and rework the paper, um, but one of the easiest options is try submitting to a different journal. And that can be key because there are lots of different focuses and lots of different journals and editors see things in different ways. Okay, next slide, Anne. Yeah, so that's me. Jay so Shree. thank you, Amanda. Uh, Say so we'll pick up any questions about that. We'll, we'll pick up uh, pick them up at the end. So now we're going to pass over to our colleague uh, Jay Shri, who's uh, giving us uh, an author's eye view. Thank you very much for um, uh, inviting me to uh, to come and join you, Amanda uh, and Anne. Um, I'm very pleased to be here and to be able to share my experiences. Uh, with publishing in the IFLA journal. But I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that I am on. Uh, they are the Bindal people of the Biruguba nation based in Townsville, Queensland, Australia. I pay respect to their culture and their elders past, present and emerging. I've been interested in the work of IFLA for many years and occasionally uh, presented a paper at the annual IFLA conference but I hadn't published in a journal until I was elected onto the uh, Asia and Oceania, IFLA Asia and Oceania Committee. Um, so um, once, uh, once I had done that, then I became familiar with the process and just aware of um, some, of the, um, some of the areas that um, I could do research on and include in the journal. So, um, Apart from the fact that the opportunity arose um, while I was uh, on the committee, I'm an academic librarian. My title is Scholarly Communications Librarian. I've worked in academic libraries almost all my life, and I do like to publish and take the opportunity to publish when I can, although unlike Anne and Amanda, I'm not required to, to do so. Um, so usually it's a journal article, and when, I, when I'm selecting a journal to publish in, I provide or I, I, you know, I um, use the same criteria that I provide to academic and researchers. So that kind of, you know, my advice kicks in. And the key criteria that I consider, which Anne and Amanda have uh, covered to some extent, obviously the scope of the journal, what is the scope, is what I have to say appropriate 
for the IFLA journal. It's an international journal. So if you have a message there for the international community, something you want to share, that's definitely the right journal for you. Of course, the basics is it peer reviewed. Um, as Amanda explained, that if um, the journal is peer reviewed, then it'll get assessed by experts. And ultimately, this will make it a better product. Uh, so, you know, you want your, um, your paper to be peer reviewed um, so that you can share it with the outside world. And absolutely is a journal open access. Um, what that means is that once your paper is published, um, you would like to make the content freely available to anyone, anywhere. And again, as an academic librarian, I'm committed to research being made available open access and try and practice what I preach as much as possible. And um, the IFLA journal allows you to self-archive the accepted manuscript, that final version after the peer review process has taken place uh, and make it available from an institutional repository. Is the journal indexed by other databases so that the content is discoverable? Because if you're going to do some research, you, know, you don't want it to be locked away behind a, a paywall. You want to publish in an open access journal, but you also want it to be discovered by others around the world. So when you're doing research, you start by doing research by searching databases. Um, so if you turn it around, you think, okay, well, which databases um, um, index this uh, journal? And in the case of uh, the IFLA journal, the SAGE journals, the suite of SAGE journals, EBSCO host, and at one time, Web of Science indexed um, the IFLA journal as well. Does it have an impact factor? So an impact factor is often used by academics to assess quality based on citations. For me personally, uh, I'm not so hung up on whether a journal has a high or low impact factor, but I was particularly pleased to see that the IFLA journal did have a, a journal impact factor of 1.4. And last year, in, in fact, it was ranked um, as a Q1 journal, which means that it was in the top 25% of all journals in the category of library and information sciences. So um, I ended up uh, publishing two articles in the IFLA journal um, over a space of time. Uh, my first one was published back in 2015 uh, with a couple of IFLA colleagues. And the way it happened, we were at a IFLA midterm meeting uh, in Malaysia. We were just chatting over lunch. And I think one of my co-authors is uh, at the webinar today. Um, and we just started talking about uh, collaborating together. Uh, one was a, an academic and the other two of us were uh, academic librarians. And we came up with the idea of looking at uh, open access repositories in our own institutions. So what we did initially was produce a conference paper uh, and we wanted to look at um, what was being done at our respective institutions in three different countries, what our different experiences were, there was different repository software being used, different uh, ways um, of setting up the, um, the repositories. So we wanted to come up with some guidelines for others um, so that you know, it'd be useful for them to set up their own repositories. So uh, we did a paper uh, at the IFLA conference and then we converted it into uh, an article. And to convert it into an article, IFLA doesn't just automatically publish the paper. You do need to add uh, at least 30% new content which then will go through the peer review process that Amanda mentioned. Uh, luckily, between us, we collected a lot of material uh, at the outstart. So we had a lot of content there already. And we, we, um, there was a lot of toing and froing in between three countries, three time zones. Um, but we got there and we, we published um, our article, first article in the Flood Journal in 2015. And I have to say, I was super impressed with Steve Witt um, as the editor of the journal, uh, and also the editing and proofreading process at Sage. Now I've published in several different journals. Um, IFLA journal, a Sage journal is just one of them. And I have to say that I'm super impressed with the process that they have um, in place. And they really did make our, um, uh, our article, uh, you know, uh, of, of much better quality. 
And the second opportunity arose some years later when there was a call for um, a special issue on services for Indigenous um, uh, clients. And at that time, I happened to, to move uh, jobs uh, to James Cook University. And it was right um, at the, um, um, the start of when uh, COVID uh, hit the world and, and everything seemed to shut down. Um, but it gave me the opportunity to, to get into my paper. And um, where we live in Northern Australia, uh, we're, we're naturally drawn to writing about some of the services and resources um, for Indigenous clients because we have a high Indigenous population in Northern Australia. And um, one, of the, um, one of the things I was encouraged to do was um, work with colleagues in, uh, in encouraging them to publish. So I, I approached a colleague to work with me uh, on the paper and uh, she was super excited because she'd never published before. And she said, but are you sure? I've never done this before, I'd love to. And I said, yes, that's fine. And uh, we ended up um, with a three-way um, collaboration. Uh, I mentored her through the process and we published an article on reconciliation in Australia and then the role academic libraries can play. Um, to overcome the gap that exists between uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples, how um, the academic library can uh, uh, provide support. Um, so um, both of these papers um, have been well received. Um, I'll go on to the next section, talk about submission and reviewing and come back to the review process for both of these papers. Um, I will say that when you are submitting your paper right at the start, allow plenty of time. You're going to submit it online, um, as Anne mentioned. Uh, I would allow a good two hours, at least, for the full submission process to take place. Now, have you heard of the culinary term mise en place? It's a French term, and I absolutely love it, because what it means is that before you start cooking, have everything in place first, all your ingredients measured, all the utensils that you need, your mixing bowls, your spoons, your equipment. And it's exactly the same process. That's how I see it. Have everything ready because I can't tell you how often I'm in the middle of submission. I'm thinking, oh, I haven't got my colleagues ORC ID or I haven't got their bio. And shoot, it's late night. I can't get it right away, you know. So have everything uh, ready um, with the abstract. Um, with um, the Flood Journal, it was it had to be two hundred words or less. And of course, my initial abstract had been more, so I had to cut it down there and then. Um, I have to provide author bios, their contact details, their org IDs, and again, uh, had to ensure that the paper was no more than eight thousand words. Um, the other thing you do need to do is um, you need to strip out all the personal information, all the author information from the manuscript because there is a double blind process, review process carried out. What that means is that the reviewers who will review your paper won't know who you are and you won't know who they are. So that's called double uh, blind. So you need to strip out all that personal information. You need to separate out the content from the, um, the author title details. Um, so you will, again, as Amanda uh, mentioned, you'll get feedback from two different reviewers. Uh, and sometimes, you know, it'll be two different lots, quite different lots of feedback. Uh, sometimes, um, they will be along the same line. Sometimes only one will provide any substantial feedback, but whatever it is, it will ultimately improve your overall article. It will improve the quality of it. So try as much as possible to incorporate those changes. Disappointed as you may be, as Amanda mentioned, you know, have a look at it. And if you think that it's not doable, uh, then yes, absolutely let the editor know that actually this is completely impractical. And on one occasion, I remember uh, publishing with another journal, one of the reviewers said to me, that can't possibly be uh, uh, with reference to my institution. And I said, yes, actually it is. And here's the evidence, you know, so absolutely feel free to do that. And um, it's a good two month uh, process. 
to, to get your, um, your uh, feedback uh, back to, to you, so be patient. And I tell you, the final result will make it worthwhile. Our last paper, once we'd made all the changes, there was just one comment, a wonderful paper. And that was really lovely. It was, it was worthwhile, all the extra work that we had to do. And yes, uh, 2020, uh, 2021 was a different experience um, because of world events. Uh, it was a slower process. Um, the submission date um, had to be extended by a couple of months, which actually gave us more time. And we were working with a specialist guest editor in another country and reviewers in other countries. So it did take a little bit longer, but um, you know, it was perfectly understandable. And you know, we tried to sort of keep the communication uh, going. And I have to say, uh, my colleagues, um, they were super excited. Um, as soon as I did the submission, they were like at our team meetings, do you want to tell everyone we published? And I'm saying, actually, no, that was just a, a submission. Oh, OK, then. Uh, once we'd done the peer review process, uh, I said, OK, we've done it. And I said, no, 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 we haven't been accepted yet. That's just the, um, you know, the second part. And then finally, when we were accepted, can we tell them we're published? Yes, but the paper's still in press. It's online. Uh, and in fact, um, although it's been online since January, our reconciliation paper, uh, it was going to be published in the June issue, and now it's going to be October. So there's, there's been a, a lot of uh, issues because of um, what's been going on and how it's affected people's lives the, the world over. Um, but we are very, very proud of our paper. So um, my overall uh, experience, I definitely highly recommend that you publish in the IFLA journal. I have published um, with uh, other publishers, a number of other publishers. Uh, with the IFLA journal, your research will reach an international audience. And with the reconciliation paper, again, we wanted to tell the world how it is in Australia. Um, and, you know, we use the, the term reconciliation in terms of bridging that gap. I don't think the term is used in the same way uh, in other countries. So it was good to be able to explain that. And James Cook, Cook University actually has a unique story to tell. So look out for that paper. Um, and also, as I said, um, the journal has um, a, a great editor and uh, I am really impressed with the proofreading and editing support that they provide. When I got the final feedback for the second paper, they had all these comments on the references and I thought, no, no, it can't be. I did so many checks on my reference list, but they were right. They picked up so many things that somehow <laughs> managed to, to miss and they helped make it a, a, a much better pro a product. So, and also since then, I've been invited to um, uh, peer review papers in the IFLA journal um, based on uh, my input and, and I got invited to present on this panel. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jayshree. And there are Jayshree's papers. Uh, so do go and have a look at those uh, and you can see the fruits of her labor. Now we've got a few more slides, but I am aware of the time, Amanda. So we're gonna have to whip through these pretty quickly. Uh, okay. I lost my mouse, sorry. <laughs> so, so there were lots of, <clears throat> there were lots of, I'm just very quickly running through what kind of support there is for you as authors. SAGE has a number of different resources. Some of these are open access, some of these are behind paywalls, but there's also lots of other articles out there. More recently, there's the, um, the article that the editor, Steve Witt, has published called Publishing an IFLA Journal, Balancing Between the Global and the Local. That's definitely a good thing to look at. Um, if you've got um, anyone in-house in your organizations who can look at it and provide support around that research that's really helpful too and those of you who work in um, academic institutions may find that you can tap into research support services there next slide Anne. thank you so having been accepted Yay, finally, long process, as Jay Shree has said. 
Um, you can look at what you're going to do post publication. In these days, you've got a lot of control over how you can promote your own paper. Things like search engine optimization and the abstracting and indexing services and the Sage journal platforms are all managed by Sage and they do a really fantastic job of this. You can look at different alerts and usage and citation tracking. Basic things even such as Google Scholar citations can give you just a general feeling for has anyone looked at your paper. Um, there's kudos, which you can use to improve, increase your impact. Um, go and have a look at that for yourself. Put it in your institutional repository if you've got one, if you've got access to one. Um, put it on Facebook, tweet about it, put it on Instagram. Use lots of hashtags. Those will get it picked up with the people who will then disseminate it more widely. Figshare is also really great and tracks your downloads, but your institutional repositories may do those as well. And in New Zealand, and probably Australia has something similar, although I don't know exactly, if you put things into an academic institutional repository, it will be picked up by the NZ Research website, which is a centralised point of contact for all the research that's done in New Zealand. You can, thanks Anne, um, link it to your email signature. That's a really quick one. Um, even if you have to copy and paste it because your organization controls your signature. Send it around to your colleagues, print a copy and put it in a T area. Um, follow other accounts that have the same interests um, and share it at conferences with fellow researchers. If it's come out of a conference, that seems like it's a bit of a loop going back into it, but research builds on other research and essentially you want to get it as well known as you possibly can. Tell your manager, make sure your head of your organization knows about it, um, well, for depending on the organization, but it's, you know, it is, it's really cool to have something published. Um, it's, it's the purpose, purpose of research. It's important to research that it is out there because if the research isn't disseminated and promoted and read and understood, then there was really very little point of doing it in the first place. Um, other channels, um, if you're in Australia, consider writing something for the conversation, which, and I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of you will know about that, and if you don't, go and have a look at it. It's an online newspaper which has academics working with the editors to write articles relevant to current events based on research. It's really excellent. Um, Look at other specialist journals, see other authors who've written on the same topic, contact them, tell them about your research, talk to them about your research, their research, post it or add it to things like ResearchGate, academia.edu, and any other platform that you can upload your papers to. If you're really keen, set yourself up a Google Scholar profile and start adding your papers into that as well. And what have I missed, Jayshree, what have I missed from those? I think that's all good. We want to leave some time for questions and we haven't really, so um, there's so much to talk about. As you can see, here's some useful contacts. So our contacts are on there. So do contact any of us if you want yep. to know more about what we've been talking about. We said Steve is the editor. Miriam Hodge is our contact at Sage. Um, and uh, do go and look at IFLA's publications page because not only IFLA Journal, of course, there's a whole range of publications you can look at. So I'm going to stop sharing and uh, we can um, think about some questions. I saw there was a couple of questions in uh, the comments chat. Said, there were comments in. Oh, yeah. comments. Yeah, I suppose Sushi. we should just say before we do run out of time, thank you so much to Jayshree for coming and participating in this webinar with Anne and I as one of the published authors, yes. um, we quite consciously looked for, uh, the, the editor sent us a list of names, so we picked somebody who was not an academic, because you've got the academic perspective from Anne and I, but somebody who's a practitioner, who's got the experience of publishing, and of publishing more than once with a journal, which was really great as well. Any questions, though? Thank you all for coming. Um, did, will we have a declaration of participation in the event? I'm not sure about that, but we'll talk to Charlie, who's the chair of the editorial board. Um, there are four of these webinars around the world, so it may well be possible to get something like that. 
um, organised, but we'll we'll check with Charlie on it. Publishing chance. Do you know, often those uh, book chapters, uh, the books often come out of the uh, IFLA conference, the Congress. Uh, so often, you know, there are, are special sessions around a particular topic, or maybe there are um, the satellite uh, events uh, that happen at IFLA, and sometimes those are, are made into, into books. So I think that's... It's participation in those really is how how to get the uh, how to get into the book chapters, yeah, uh, into the book I chapters. did see I did see a call for papers yeah. for a monograph uh, yeah. just last night I think uh, on the uh, on the IFLA list. So if you subscribe to the IFLA L generic list, uh, a lot of calls um, for papers um, uh, comes through that list. Yeah. Yeah, and it, yeah, and in fact, um, although there are those satellite conferences, as Jay Shree says, sometimes um, uh, there are uh, you know book proposals put forward to De Gruyter, who is the publisher of the IFLA uh, book series. Um, so yeah, so look at look out for calls for papers uh, or call for calls for chapters, I suppose, um, like that as well. Any other questions? If you don't want to um, type in the chat box, as you say, we're very, uh, you're very welcome to email any of us or uh, Steve in particular can give you more of an overview uh, of processes. Um, but if there's anything that e any of us have said that you want to pick up on, do email us directly. Very happy to uh, be contacted. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So now, Mihi, thank you, everybody. Um, thanks for attending. And um, yeah, good to see you all. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you.